We're taking a look back at 2023. And the first thing I have to say is I am sorry. One of the tools I said that you guys should go out and get if you're in a similar situation to me, I was wrong. So what I decided to do was take a look back over all my videos. And in this one, I've picked out five videos where we're gonna go back and, well, we're gonna troll me. And I'm gonna show you what has stood up to the test of time and, well, what hasn't. And stick around till the end because I'm gonna open up the Start Making channel to you guys and give you guys a rundown of what's coming next year. And also, was this year worth it? Did I break even? Did I make money? Did I lose money? We won't go into details, but I'll answer that question for you. And affiliate links are part of the lifeblood of a small channel. I am sorry, I know you get bombarded with so many of them and red sponsors and all of this, but when you're the size that we are, we have to do a few affiliate links. Everything you see in this video is down in the description, but I will tell you at the end what the three most popular tools have been this year through the clicks. Right, let's leap straight in with the first video and I have to say, this was the second most popular video that I released last year, so thank you for everybody who viewed it. We're gonna whiz through this really quickly, and spoiler alert, when I come to the end and tell you the three best-selling items that you guys have clicked on this year, some of them might be here. This video was aimed at trying to give advice to people just starting out on their woodworking journey, and these are some of the tools that I think make it easier. Now, let's have a look back and see if that information is still accurate. Sandpaper. What I said was 3M extract for your everyday stuff, but if you are just doing something that requires cheap sandpaper, use that, but make sure it's got holes for your dust extraction. I 100% stand by that. That is the best sandpaper I have ever used, and if I'm just doing a rough job, I use that for everything else. If I'm picking up one of these mice, I got the cheap stuff on it, whatever I can find. This is a no brainer. If you're working in a tight space, this right angle drill bit holder, say no more. I stand by that. Let's quickly move on to the saws. I claimed that a Japanese pull saw is better than your traditional Western saw. But I'm gonna say there is one caveat here. The flush trim saw is amazing, but if I want to cut square, then this style saw and a bench hook seems to give me better results. Another one with fine print, I recommended these pencils. Pika make them, Tracer make them. The reason I did is for all the features listed in the video, but you guys were right. You said to me that the one with the thick lead is only good for rough construction. And when I was building this workshop, you were absolutely spot on. It goes blunt a little bit too quick to use for your everyday marking out. So I picked up this one, the Pika propelling pencil, and I went for the H leads so that they've got more stability to them. And that matched with that, I now think is the perfect pencil set. However, for all of you saying a perfectly good propelling pencil and a normal HB sharpenable pencil is pretty good, yeah, you are absolutely right. I just like the fact these have a holster so you don't lose them. The Craig jig over the portable jig. Now, I swear by this Craig jig. It's easy, it's repeatable, it's accurate, and you get a better finish than what I was getting with the handheld Wolfcraft. However, I've used this less this year than I've used the handheld one because I've been using it to get into tight spaces. You cannot do that with this one. And on top of that, I did quite a lot of work with two befores when I was making my planters and I couldn't even get a two before into this. So yes, this is the best way to get good quality pocket holes. However, don't chuck away your cheap ones or your portable little ones. They are priceless. And I am sorry that I said that you don't need it. I love this Veritas honing guide. However, and this is a big however, it is expensive. You could probably buy five of these for the same price, the cheaper one. I stand by one of the things that I said. This is the best I've ever used for plain blades. The reason for that is the stability of the wide wheel, but now you can get the cheaper ones that cover that. So on top of that, I like the fact that it comes with the guide so you get the depth, so you get the right angle on your blade. However, you can get a block that you stick wood to that counteracts that. So what I'm saying, I guess, here is both work. But the one place this fails, and it's frustrated me since getting it, is chisels. You cannot really grip a thin chisel in this without buying the attachment, which is another however many pounds or dollars, whatever you buy it in. 
and that frustrates me. So, I go with both. This is for my chisels, and this is for my planes. Now, it's not ideal, but at least now you know. I forgot tool number eight, sorry. This is a self-centered drill bit. No, that's egotistical. Self-centering drill bit. Whether you go with the expensive or the cheap, both of them will come in really useful, but this one will always feel better when you use it. I guess the message I was trying to get throughout that video to anybody watching is, we all do woodworking differently and we all start with a different circumstance, budget, etc. Work with what you've got, take the advice you can afford to take, but also do what you feel more comfortable with because at the end of the day, that's what you can do. And you'll enjoy this a lot more that way. I did make one promise at the start that there was gonna be some new things in here to talk about. And I'm not just rehashing old footage and information because you guys have probably watched most of it. So here it is. You wanna buy the woodworker or the maker in your life one thing this year and you want it to be something that you know they probably don't have? Well, here it is, and it won't cost you very much at all. That. You see these all over the place with sellotape in it, scotch tape. What drives me nuts about this blue tape, and again, watch videos, it has infinite uses, but what drives me nuts is trying to find the end. Have it there so that you can always rip a little bit off every time you need to use it for everything. And then, Double up your efficiency. Stick a French cleat on it. You buy that for a maker this Christmas, they will love you. And you've only spent a couple of quid. The next video we're gonna talk about is definitely in my top five for beginners. I wish that alongside a plane video or a sharpening video, I wish I'd found this one at the start of my woodworking journey because it would have saved me so much grief and poor results. Now, beginner woodworkers don't wanna go out and buy a table saw or a miter saw right from the get-go. So what do you do? For me, this is still the first tool that I bought with a powered option for cutting wood, my circular saw. But they are not accurate freehand. Not unless you're an expert. Beginners, you have to try and work around what you have. So if you're doing rip cuts, a straight edge and some clamps gets the job done. You could even do what I did when I was cutting the roof. You could knock together your very own parallel guide track saw kind of thing. If you're cutting two by fours all day long or something simple, this and a speed square works perfectly. But what if you want to take it up a little bit and get repeatability and a bit more accuracy? Well, that's where I said in my thumbnail, really Craig, have you just nailed square cuts? And then we put it to the test. Now, this was about seven months ago that I got this and at the time I tested it for a month or so before talking about it and I loved it. And I have to say, I still love it. Sure, it's not perfect. And it's only as perfect as how square your base and your blade is on your circular saw. Is it still something I would recommend for the price? Firstly, if you're watching over in the US, 100% yes. Because I've seen it in the shops, anything as low as seven to eight dollars, usually it's about 20. In the UK, it goes between 45 and 59. I paid, I think, about 60 pound for mine. And even then, I still think yes. But it's more of a question of, can you justify the cost in your woodworking? Here's the thing with this that a speed square can't do. A speed square cannot give you the repeatability that this can do. Stick a stop block on it and you can actually start to cut really accurately and repetitively. Secondly, for a beginner woodworker, the safety element of this compared to a speed square is much higher because the bars, so long as your hands are nowhere near the bars, you know you're nowhere near the blade. The finish, because you have the base in there, you're gonna get a zero clearance insert of sorts kind of finish, which will stop tear out. But is it as good as I said in the video? You know what, I have to be completely honest with you. The clamps have come off since I've had it and I don't miss them. But here's the one thing that annoys me more than anything about this. In order to use it on longer pieces, you need to pull these wings out to support the wood. I don't claim to be the strongest woodworker in the world, but equally, I'm not weak. Ugh. Well, not as weak as this makes me look. Here's the thing with those. That it may seem like a bit of a bugbear, but the natural response to not being able to pull that out is to grab the bar, because that's where you can get your purchase. And to me, that is a silly thing to have to do, because the bar is the thing that keeps your cut square. So that is my bugbear, but still, 
If you're a beginner woodworker and you're looking out for something, a hack that's gonna help you before you take the leap to buy a table saw, this will do the job. I've come to the first big bit of news for next year and for the videos you're gonna see in the future. I have taken the plunge and it scares me a little bit, but I have bought myself a table saw. I've gone with a contractor saw. I've gone with what I think is one of the better ones um, due to the fence and that's gonna be coming up in future videos. I really hope you stick with me for that, but let me just put your mind at ease. I am not going to make this channel unrelatable with massive amounts of equipment because I think that is what my skill level dictates at this stage. The next video covers two. I confessed when I got this for the first time this year that it scared me. I was a little bit nervous using it handheld and I have to say what I built for it gave me the confidence to keep using it and the uses you get out of it are amazing. This is a trim router and this, well, this is a trim router table. I had to make two videos because the first time it wasn't perfect. When I first built this, I made the bare bones of it and it worked. However, if you look at the top, when I first built it, it was plywood. I've had to put a veneer on top. First major change that I would do, if you're gonna go down this route, get a smooth topped melamine, something like that, that you can use as the top of this. And here's a really big tip. You don't need the drawers. You don't need the T-track. You don't need the T-track. You don't need the fence. You could, you don't even need the insert. You could, just have a piece of wood with a hole in it with your router screwed on the underside that will do a pretty good job. Everything else that I added from there on out is what made this more practical, a little bit better, a little bit easier to use. This fence holds not only the dust extraction at the back, which is also linked to the router itself when you put it in, but this fence is really handy if you're not using bearing topped router bits. So these adjustable fence pieces that move in and out so you can tighten up this middle gap, these are the biggest win out of this. So if you're gonna do nothing else but make a fence, add these on. It's a 10 minute extra job where you just add a little bit of hardware like I showed you in the video. This for me is the real win. If you have one of these sitting around and all you ever use it for is roundovers, I urge you, make something to house it because just doing rebates has sped up my box making process infinitely. You can buy these tables. I know that Jonathan Katz Moses in the States sells them. I know Axminst to stock them. If mine had a melamine top on it, I think I'd say, do you know what? I'm happier with this. Including the mitre gauge, it hasn't cost a fraction of what Axminster's comes to. Although I bet that is a good quality table. There is one splurge that will probably save you a lot of grief. For the sake of 30 pound, I know that's not a little amount of money, but I've just bought myself a spare. So this now will be forever in the router table. So all I have to do is clip that in, clip it back out again, put it back in this when I wanna use it for normal use. And actually just not having to find a screwdriver, losing the screws and doing all of that is going to mean I use this every time I need it. <sighs> this seems a good a time as any to tell you the one tool or the one recommendation that I made. <sighs> that, well, let's just say I was wrong. And it's hard sometimes to say, do you know what? I got this completely wrong. It's not the right tool for the job. Because when I said it, I was in my shed with no electricity. I had very limited dust extraction and I needed something that I could attach to my tools that was gonna stop all of that dust in the air. And well, this is what I had. It does a job. I still use it to clean up in here, but that's because I haven't got better dust extraction sorted out yet. It's on the way. However, when I said this is what you need if you're in a shed with no power, you know what? This is the bare minimum you need. All it does is mean that you are going to take some of the dust away at source, but maybe 50%. It has one fatal flaw, and that's this. When you turn on the extraction, this thing tenses up, and you can probably be this far away from your tool at all times. It's basically not helping me do a good job with whatever's on that end. If you can save up and get one of the better items, then I think that's going to be the way to go. Okay, for the next vid, oh, that looks rubbish. We're gonna do this one, but let's just get it into a better place so you can see it. 
Lighting is always going to be an issue in a workshop, but I think I'm going to have to put it here and it is full and it's heavy. Anyway, here, here it is. There's no magic. I just lifted it. I built these because I wanted flexible and cheap storage within my workshop. And I think we got that right. For the drawers in the cabinet, it's one sheet of half inch or 12 mil plywood and half a sheet of three quarter inch or 18 mil plywood. And that's it. A little bit of trim. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. I made the sides out of the three quarter inch ply and then I routed in every single groove to hold the base of the drawer that I could then build the drawer on. Now, that's the cheapest way, but you've got to have a router. If you don't have a router, one video that I've watched recently that actually lays out how to do them a different way is from Whitworks, a great channel over in the States. What he did instead of routing these because he was worried about losing stability on the side walls, he actually put blocks of plywood along to act as the spaces between the runners. The only thing is that's gonna cost you more in wood. Routing them out is time consuming. I did it with a straight edge guide. You could build a jig for it. There are many other ways that I would do it differently now, but it still worked well for what I needed. Did I get it right first time? I never do. I showed you that in the video. So if you wanna see mistakes, head over there. It's worth it. I wanted the drawers to be perfectly flexible. Let me show you. I made a double drawer that I wanted to be able to put anywhere in the cabinet. And then I made a series of single drawers that could equally go anywhere in the cabinet. Here's some of the mistakes I made. Firstly, I didn't make the drawers far enough apart to give myself enough leeway. I wanted to make it perfect. You don't have to do that. Don't make the sides of the drawer quite so high and then your flexibility goes up. Mine, well, I've never moved a single drawer up or down since I've had this in place seven months, give or take. Also, if you are measuring the width for the base of the drawer, which is the bit that everything runs on, only leave yourself a mil or two maximum on either side because the more you leave, the more this chatters around and the more it sticks. Also, best bit of advice I got in the comments, wax your drawers, wax the runners, wax the inside bit. I did that and now they slide in beautifully, in and out, no problems at all. This one is a basic one, but it covers all builds you do with a circular saw and plywood. When you're doing a long cut across the grain or any cut really on a piece of plywood, tape up the line you're going to cut because I had tear out all over this project and I kept telling myself it's a shop project, no one's gonna care, I care. As you can see here, the sides just go straight into the front. You could put another face on these and then you won't have to worry about how you're attaching it. However, I put nails in because you know what? I don't care about the aesthetics that much and I wanted to get the project done. Everything else about this, I'm really happy with, especially this. This is something I'm immensely proud of. And this is something that just came to me while I was building this, sharpening. It's something that I am so lazy about, but if I make it this easy, surely I'm gonna do it more. And all it is is a tray that just fits in and all your sharpening stuff's right there whenever you need it. If you can do this anywhere in your workshop where maybe it slides under your workbench, maybe it just goes in one of your cupboards, but it's all together on one of these and you can just clamp it to your workbench, makes this, way better than it was before. I have one idea, and I want you guys to tell me if this is silly or if this is smart. What if you make a series of these trays and don't put drawers on them, don't even put fronts on them, just have a series of trays in a unit like this? What if then you put on each of your trays the jigs that you use on your workbench? I'm talking about your bench hook, I'm talking about your shooting board. I'm talking about those blocks of wood that are screwed together that you use on top of your workbench and you have nowhere to put them. So you hang them on a wall, you stack them against the workbench. What about the tile that you use for flattening your hand planes? What about everything that you can just mount on top of one tray piece of wood? You could slide into these and you could fit maybe 12 into one of these cabinets and you just pull them out, much like this sharpening tray. You clip them onto your workbench use them, and then you put them away. Everything in its place. Just like a French cleat wall. Anyway, what makes a good video? What makes a video get 400 plus thousand views? Uh, if you know, tell me, because I've got no idea. Anyway, it was all about these jewelry boxes. My idea was make a jewelry box as a beginner, learn the skills it takes to make the jewelry box and sell it for a small profit to maybe buy yourself a new tool. Maybe if you make six, you could get yourself a fairly inexpensive hand plane or a new chisel, something like that. 
So it's a double win and they're fun. I did have a lot of people who make stuff professionally and have Etsy stores, etc., saying the profit margin's just not in it for this. There's too many stages, too many pieces. You're absolutely right. I would not be batching these out to sell because to be honest with you, there are other ways you can make your money. There's other channels that will tell you how to do that and what sells at that moment in time. These are just a fun little gift, fun little project and a learning curve. Probably the biggest takeaway or two of that video that people seemed the most impressed by, not my tricks, was one, using double-sided tape to line up your hinges, well worth checking out. And the second one, using a Ryobi saw to cut the lid off by running it across your table with some blocks of wood attached to it. I've used that for box lid removal ever since. And it is the easiest, most accurate way I know how now. But one eagle-eyed person in the comments made a very good point. I had waxed the bottom of my table and the bottom of the block that was sliding on it and dust had got on it. And actually one of the corners didn't line up because of that. So if you're gonna do it, make sure, and I use a kitchen tile for this now, make sure you have a perfectly flat surface with no extra wax. I called this a one board project. And then I made six out of it and everyone said you can't make six out of one board, maybe 10 boards. What I meant was you can use one type of board and roughly one of those boards will make one box. It wasn't very clearly explained, I blame myself for that. I love the fact these boxes are easy to experiment on and they're forgiven if you get it wrong. I actually gouged a huge chunk out the bottom of this one that I made in the first batch that I ever did and I put these hardwood legs on it, covered it. I think it actually looks a little bit nicer. One thing with the hinges that I neglected to put in and I neglected to do was when you're actually chiseling out for the depth of them, I marked it with a knife and my combination square. Actually, it's much easier just to set the depth on one of these and then get a really crisp line using this. This, cheapest chips, Amazon. Not a very expensive one, looks fancy. They don't cost a lot. And then finally, a lot of you ask where you can get felt lined foam that doesn't have ring slots cut in it. Long story short, I have no idea. I bought loads of this when Amazon stocked it. Haven't seen it since. There is a workaround. I'll put the ingredients in the link below where you can basically get foam and you can get a sticky back felt. You can make your own. They're not as good, but they will do in a pinch. And lastly, if you're a beginner and you're a little bit worried about spending the money on any level of wood, there are plenty of places you can pick up pallet wood and you can make yourself some lovely boxes out of that too. Right, the bit you've been waiting for. The three tools that you guys have bought the most from what I've recommended. In third place, Shinto rasp. I did a video where I said this would, could replace most of your rasps and you guys didn't hold back. Second most popular, the Dewalt right angled drill bit holder thingy. It'll get you out of a pinch. And top, and I don't think you're gonna be surprised by this, the most bought item from anything on every list I've ever dished out, it's not the Pika pencil. It's the self-centering drill bit. What I promise to tell you is break even, win or lose. Now, the figures I've accounted for here are views and ad revenue. They are affiliate links through Amazon and any super chats that I've been gifted on any of the videos. I haven't gone down any other income route at this stage. So with all of that, and the outgoings being camera equipment, wood, this entire workshop and its build, any tools that I've bought, any tools that I've bought to review, the magic number is exactly down the line, break even. And that may not sound like a huge triumph to anybody watching, but the entire workshop from start to finish, and there'll be a video next year with the cost, I promise, I've been promising this for a little while, but to break even at the end of a year of a trial of something that I've been so passionate about and I've enjoyed so much is a testament to each and every single one of you watching. I've loved making the videos, it's never been a chore, but the fact that you have clicked some of them up to 400 plus thousand views staggers me. Every single time I look at the figures go up, read a comment, see people subscribing, watch that figure creep ever closer to a higher number than I ever dreamt of, all I ever think is how grateful I am that I have got this community around me. 
I put out one video that I am especially proud of this year, and that is where I recommended some channels to you lot. And you guys picked up that mantle for me. You went to check out the videos, you commented on my video, you commented on theirs, you subscribed to those channels. I have the nicest people that watch my channel, the most supportive. So when I'm stuck to a roof in 20 plus 28 degree heat and the roller breaks and all of the calamities happen, I wait for the comments because I know that that video is going to get some serious support and is going to get some lovely comments. I read them and I'm on to building the next stage. Take a minute to sit down and thank yourselves from me for helping me along this journey because I wouldn't be here without you guys and I certainly wouldn't be able to wrap up the year on such a positive note. Whatever you're doing to bring in the end of this year, to bring in the holiday season, I wish you happiness and health and I suggest, I highly suggest, you start making. If you've enjoyed this video, then yeah, the next one will be out soon or pick one from the channel. If this is your first video, subscribe. Be part of the community. Thank you very much for watching. Take care.